Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us again in our bite-sized corrosion series. This last couple of sessions, we have been talking about concrete, concrete degradation and concrete corrosion. Vanessa is taking a well-earned break, and so I'm your host for the day. Today, I am joined by my good friend and colleague, Brian Wyatt. I met Brian 40 odd years ago, in fact, almost 40 years to the day. It was in 1982 when we were both working on a project in Mozambique. And I had the rather rare pleasure of telling Brian that he was smoking something and dealing with pie in the sky. Fortunately, he managed to convince me otherwise. Since then, we have had a long standing technical relationship which I think has been quite successful. And so, Brian, please, will you introduce yourself and then we'll carry on from there. Thank you, Neil. I remember that well. Pleasure. And we've, we've used that survey technique uh, between us all over the world to success. And it, it's a real pleasure to be here today. And, and we're, we're currently working on a, a major stealing concrete project together, which is also a great pleasure to me. In this sector, in stealing concrete, I was involved in the first full-scale trial of CP in concrete in the UK in the 1980s. Later, I was involved in most of the earliest commercial CP of stealing concrete applications in the UK and internationally. And it's good to be here today to share this with the engineers of the future from South Africa. You've really got me there because, Brian, I've been telling my clients for years that steel cannot be protected by means of cathodic protection unless it's in an electrolyte. Now, here we're talking about the structures that are in the air, and yet we're going to apply cathodic protection. Please elucidate. Yes, Neil. We, here we have on the screen, a, a uh, hopefully you can see my screen, a, uh, um, a steel in concrete structure, it's a beam, a series of beams holding up a major port. And as you can see, it's, it's in the air. You're quite right, if we were just looking at steel, then we have no electrolyte to enable the current to pass from our cathodic protection anodes uh, through the electrolyte onto the steel and thus prevent corrosion. Uh, with steel in concrete, the concrete itself is the electrolyte and we pass uh, current from anodes on or in the electrolyte, the concrete, onto the steel. And if we pass sufficient current to overcome the corrosion current, then we prevent the corrosion of the steel from the concrete. So that's the difference. We can't do it in air uh, if we don't have the concrete. Yeah, so and where did this all start? It started with a rather innovative bridge engineer in North America. And the, the first application was on one of the bridges over the harbour entrance in San Francisco. Not, not, not the famous um, red bridge, but there's, there's a concrete bridge. And that bridge was affected by sea mist. You, you'll know about um, airborne chlorides in South Africa. Um, you have the lucky wind that comes in from the uh, southeast and, uh, and, and deposits salt um, over much of the Cape. Lucky for corrosion engineers, I guess. And then in, in, uh, in Northern California, they were spreading de-icing salts on their bridges in the winter because of ice and uh, dangers of, of, to traffic and, uh, and personnel. And he, he, he did a lot of development work there and then up into uh, Canada where, where, where the Canadian highways people did a lot of excellent research. And um, I, I, I was lucky enough to get involved in the first major trial in the UK and I'll just run through obviously stealing stealing concrete it doesn't normally corrode the concrete has a high pH and um, the, the passive film that's formed at that high pH protect the steel from corrosion so most steel in concrete will never corrode but chloride ions migrate from the outside towards the steel and when they're sufficient at the steel interface the corrosion will start and uh, carbon dioxide gas from the air diffuses into the concrete and uh, reduces the alkalinity and corrosion starts at about pH 10. So here we have the diagram showing how, how this all happens. The chlorides come in, 
please note there's no cracks in the concrete at the moment. And then we generate some corrosion in the center here. And the corrosion product is significantly larger volume than the steel that is consumed to make it. And the, the, the corrosion current flows off the anode onto the non-corroding areas, the cathode, and the, that circuit has to be completed. Hence, we need the electrolytes and we need continuity uh, in, in the structure. And the anodic reaction is that, the cathodic reaction is that. Let's not get too technical about this. And the high volume causes cracking and then delamination of the concrete. You see some nice example, corrosion and cracking out of the Middle East. And here again, we, we see the corrosion current. And then with a mixed metal oxide coated titanium anode on the surface of the concrete, it will later in the process be encapsulated, embodied into a sprayed concrete overlay. Then the current flows from the external power supply. And if sufficient current reaches the areas that were corroding uh, to overcome the corrosion current, then the corrosion stops. And coming back to these early UK schemes, the first of these were on uh, what's called the Midland Links motorway system around Birmingham, about 40 kilometers of elevated uh, motorway. And all of these bridge beams have got expansion joints above them. And for corrosion engineers, expansion joints are really good news because they all leak and they drop chlorides onto the top of the beams. Uh, the beams uh, began to corrode about year 15. And we, we were involved in about 1979 in the first trial there. These are conductive coating anodes applied to the concrete surface with a, with a protective ray overlay coating. These beams have not been treated yet. This is after about five years and the coating was beginning to fail. But the, the, the overall performance of the CP system was adequate for the best part of 10 years. If you go back to that, that other slide you had were showing the piles, the piers and the water, yes. um, that, that begs the question that, you know, seawater is very high in chloride, 3% salt, as we know. And yet, generally, we don't see immersed structures suffering from the same problem. Um, how come? Well, if the immersed structure is fully water saturated, then the pores in the concrete, the concrete is a porous material, and the, the, the cement paste between sand and the aggregate performs the binder, but that cement paste is porous, it has holes in it. And if those holes are all filled with water, then there's insufficient oxygen transmission through the concrete to maintain any significant corrosion rate. Theoretically, it's actually still corroding because the passive film has, has broken down and the uh, steel concrete potential becomes lots more negative. It is um, anodic. But uh, where the concrete is water saturated, the corrosion rate is negligible. However, as you can see here, this is a rather interesting project I was involved in, in in Torquay on the south coast of England. The fully immersed steel in concrete, which you can't see because the water's in the way, was not corroding. And the corrosion started at just about mid-tide and uh, just got worse and worse all the way up. And that, that was uh, sorted with body protection. Here's a new project in North Africa, a new port, massive reinforced concrete caissons. These caissons were slip formed so that as each section was continuously cast with concrete, the formwork, which is here or here, is raised up the cast and complete and beginning to harden reinforced concrete. And we put cathodic protection on the tidal zone and the splash zone of these caissons. Obviously, they're, they're formed onshore and then they're slid off to the offshore and, and, and set in place. And here you can see the difficulty as the concrete was being poured, the construction team had to fit the impressed current anodes. This is 
mixed metal oxide coated titanium ribbon onto the rebar without having any short circuits between one and the other. So these plastic spacers hold the ribbon off the rebar. This bare titanium strip is the conductor strip. It is uh, spot welded between all the anode rails. And as the concrete is cast and the slip forming rises up, hopefully the team has got everything in place uh, and everything's been tested as it, as it goes on. Tricky job, but very successful. Here's perhaps a, an easier way of seeing this. This is, and it comes back to your question of why doesn't the immersed concrete corrode? Well, this is a huge floating reinforced concrete box onto a jetty for berthing nuclear submarines. And as it's floating, the inside is not filled with water. The outside is water saturated, but the inside is not. So the intrados of the reinforcement uh, is full of oxygen, but the outside will require cathodic protection. And this was installed again with mixed metal oxide coated titanium ribbon. Um, there's the conductor strips, there's another one down there. And uh, you can see the, the really significant density of the steel here. But the reason this structure needed cathodic protection was because the inside was dry and air exposed and the outside uh, was water saturated. Brian, you know, the, the eternal question in all cathodic protection systems is always how much current. We've looked at a couple of different scenarios here where there's uh, varying quantities of steel in the concrete and different anode systems. How much current do you actually need in this situation, as opposed to, say, corrosion of steel in soil? How much current do you need on the steel to prevent corrosion? And is it dependent on the quality of the concrete and, and, and the atmosphere? And It's quite complex. Um, I left this, this, this slide up because we can see this is a nuclear safety implicated structure, um, very, very heavily reinforced. And you can see that there's large, these are 32 diameter bars, um, and, and there's four layers of them. The, the, the region where the chlorides will uh, reach the steel within the design life, shorter than the designer had hoped. I can tell you that, it always is, because they, they do all their tests on, on lab concrete in, in small uh, cores, and you can't cast a huge complex structure of this type uh, with such perfection of concrete. But the steel densities, firstly, are high, and we must repeat, we're putting cathodic protection current onto the steel, not onto the concrete. So it's the steel surface which which determines the current demand. And a simple answer to your question, a safe design current density for steel in concrete, which has been exposed and, and, and has started to corrode, is 20 milliamps per meter squared. And that, that's required on the outer steel. So the next steel layer down, the, the, the current will attenuate. So you cannot deliver 20 to the first layer and 20 to the second layer. If you deliver 20 to the first layer, you probably deliver 15 or so, maybe a little less, to the next layer down, and so on and so forth. It's a fundamental and quite complicated set of calculations, bearing in mind you've got laps in the steel and, and high density areas, low density areas in terms of steel density all over the structure. Then it's important that the anode system you use is able to deliver required current for the life and that uh, it, it doesn't fail during that activity, perhaps due to acidification of the concrete. So here we have mixed metal oxide coated titanium ribbon, slightly expanded. And this is my favored anode for new construction, uh, where the current requirement is somewhat lower. Some people do use it in existing corroding structures, they cut it into chases, and uh, I don't like that, they tend to fall out. My, my favorite anode system for existing structures, here's back to my 1980s largest project in the world when it was done in Abu Dhabi. These are beams to a major port. You can see here, this was the limit of the original concrete. This is where all the soffit, we saw it cracked and, and corroded earlier. 
uh, was taken out and, and repaired with spray concrete. Here's the, here's the boundary between the repair and the existing gear. Uh, that surface has been grip blast cleaned, abraded to a particular standard. Then the mixed metal oxide coated titanium ribbon is it, now a much wider expansion, has been applied to the surface. Here's the critical, absolutely critical cable to anode connection. And here we're seeing an operator having cored a small diameter hole for reference electrodes, installing uh, that electrode into a looks like a slightly too soft mix of, of, of grout. And here's uh, the spray concrete operator spraying the concrete overlay. I have to say, this is 1980s, it's Middle East, no one's wearing the, the right PPE. And um, I remind you all that you're, you're responsible for your safety on site and for those around you. So this is not a good example of PPE. Finally, we, we, we have a range of anodes that can be cored, drilled into the surface, impressed current anodes, these three here, all, all different discrete anodes. And there are also galvanic anodes. I have some fairly jaundiced views about some of those, but um, they can be installed to, to merit in concrete repairs. So the, the answer to your question is manifold because it was a very complex question. Brian, in that earlier photograph, we saw some fairly corroded steel. And we know that um, it's necessary to distribute the current over a fairly large surface. How on earth do you ensure that you get current to the entire structure? I mean, we know that buried bolted joints are not good conductors. It strikes me that uh, rusty rebars touching each other may also not be good conductors. How do we surmount that difficulty? We have the advantage that each rebar is tied with typically with soft iron wire, but there's a, a multitude of such connections within a reinforced concrete cage, uh, within the, the reinforcement cage for reinforced concrete. So generally speaking, uh, reasonable construction quality will ensure adequate electrical continuity of steel in the concrete. In the areas of the repairs, first thing that goes, of course, is the wire. So you do lose continuity in the repairs. And what, what's done there is that every area of repair is fully tested for continuity. And where necessary, bonds are made to, uh, to ensure that. And, and in that bridge joint area, there's been continuity testing and bonding. And here we see continuity testing in this uh, small select repair area. Yeah, but Brian, continuity testing, I see my most unfavorite instrument there in the form of a multimeter, what appears to be a multimeter. And, you know, if you try and use a multimeter to measure continuity, uh, well, you get continuity no matter what you do. What are you actually using? We are actually using particular specifications of multimeter. There's a, there's a number of issues going on in opposition here. If, if you use um, a, a, an earth mega, for example, the driving voltage breaks down the oxide films on the rebar and you get a false good value. There are two procedures in the standards. One is with a low voltage resistance meter, but it, but it has to be properly specified. Uh, and uh, the, the other is by measuring potential of steel in concrete to a local location whilst moving the steel test connection around the rebar. Both work too detailed to discuss today. And Brian, some of the structures that you were showing us earlier are new structures. What is the possibility of actually designing cathodic protection in from new, as you did with that, that um, floating jetty? And, and in that situation, do we still need such high currents? No, the, the current requirements are less uh, as a technique that, that, that is called by many um, cathodic prevention. And the, the current uh, density requirements there are overall to the steel, again, to the steel, a safe design number is about two milliamps per meter squared. So we've been involved in, again, some of the biggest uh, ones of these worldwide. 
and typically they are either sensitive structures which have a long service life our military nuclear safety implicated structure which was in scotland so that wasn't a hot warm environment but it's pretty salty and the, the, the other areas which are widely used are in bridges in the middle east so i think i've got some pictures here's one of the bridges that we've worked on in, in the middle east i think that one's in abu dhabi uh, and um, that was built with built-in cathodic prevention from the start the, the history of buildings in the middle east is is somewhat mixed i'm old enough to have looked forward to staying in the new gulf hotel in bahrain um, i saw it being built and when they chopped it out and they had to demolish it because it was already corroding so quickly uh, because somebody had forgotten to specify the sand which hadn't been sea dredged so it was full of chlorides as they mixed it and um, it was nice and warm and it was very salty and it corroded before they could actually build the rooms inside <laughs> the building um, so that was a, a, a so that, that was a salutary lesson to to people in the middle east and, and now some of the practice is really quite good yeah, that reminds me of a similar episode that happened in Southern Africa where they built some pre-stressed concrete pipelines using beach sand. It, it wasn't so successful. But you've got some other icons in that photograph of yours. Oh, well, yes. These are just classic pictures for me. I wasn't involved in, in, the, in, in the Sydney Opera House uh, cathodic protection, but it, it, it does have cathodic protection of stealing concrete in, in some of the areas applied about 15 maybe 10 years ago, I mean, bearing in mind that the structure is probably 40 years old now, uh, that very successful, very carefully designed and implemented system, as you might expect. The other one is, 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 is an extreme. This is Biddeford Long Bridge, which is one of the longest and oldest stone arch bridges in the UK, down in the southwest again. In the mid-1950s, they, they started to run buses over this bridge, and it wasn't quite wide enough. Um, so somebody decided to widen it, not with stone, uh, which doesn't have steel in it and doesn't corrode, but with reinforced concrete. And these are um, extended corbels, steel reinforced um, uh, uh, corbels uh, supporting an extended width deck. And by the 70s, these were falling off, which was rather embarrassing. And the local department wanted to uh, destroy the bridge and replace it with a nice new steel one. And luckily, the local population came up in arms and said, no, you can't do this. So, Ryan, thanks so much. So I'd like to thank you for the overview that you've given us of cathodic protection of steel and concrete. And so, Ryan, thanks again for joining us. Thank you all.